Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, EC webinar. Uh, the summer uh, uh, webinar series, Distinguished EC webinar series. And uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Mikhail Katz from EC Department of uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, uh, professor uh, Kurtz has been an associate professor and uh, Dugal Jackson faculty scholar at the Department of ECE, and he has also uh, got joint appointments in the departments of physics and material science and engineering. Uh, his research in, uh, interests include optical properties of uh, engineered materials, novel optical and electronic devices, uh, tailoring thermal emission, uh, and such other topics. You will hear about thermal emission in today's talk. Uh, before joining University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, he received his bachelor's in engineering physics from Cornell in 2008 and his PhD in applied physics from Harvard University in 2014. And uh, in 2018 and 19, he was identified by Web of Science as a highly cited uh, researcher. Uh, his uh, recognition includes the ONR Young Investigator Award, uh, AFOSR Young Investigator Award, NSF Career Award. IEEE Photonic Society Young Investigator Award and many others. Um, and many of you probably, at least those who took uh, my course in nanophotonics will have seen uh, his uh, uh, famous paper on uh, metasurfaces, uh, part of my uh, coursework as well. So uh, without uh, much ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Mikhail Kites to talk about thermal emission engineering. And just uh, one announcement before we, we begin. If you have any questions, please type it in the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, Mikhail will take it uh, whenever he feels it appropriate. If not, they will be answered at the end. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Guru, for, for having me for this webinar. Um, we, were, we were just talking uh, before the, the webinar started. It would be a great pleasure and honor to get to be there in person at Rice and see the labs and uh, um, really get to, get to engage some science in person, but uh, this is, I think, the, the next best thing, and we save a little bit of CO2 emissions. Um, so my talk today is going to be about um, thermal emission engineering. Um, it's going to cover uh, kind of a few areas of thermal emission measurement, things we can do, and so forth. Um, before I get started, I wanted to briefly introduce my group um, at UW-Madison. So these are just some, some images of, uh, of the group and some collaborators and some family members and so forth. Um, I've been at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for about uh, five and a half years now. And here's a picture of some of us um, in the mid-infrared uh, and infrared camera. Sorry, let me turn on the laser pointer. Um, our work generally has been funded by uh, the Office of Naval Research, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, um, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. But the work that I'm going to show you today uh, is primarily funded by ONR, NSF, DOE, and WARF. The Air Force project is kind of on a, on a different topic. Uh, the group, broadly speaking, um, does research in uh, the uh, the ranges for, uh, from the visible to the mid infrared, and we cover a lot of topics relating to optical materials, relating to shaping uh, light and doing beam shaping with uh, optical nanostructures, uh, kind of a, some less related work in engineering of human vision, um, and then also this uh, research area that I'm going to talk about today, which is thermal emission engineering and metrology, so measurement and engineering. Um, let's see. So uh, finally, I wanted to acknowledge a lot of the, uh, the folks that contributed to the research presented in this talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge in bold uh, postdocs uh, or one postdoc and graduate students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as some really key external collaborators. Actually, everybody on this slide contributed in one way or another to the work um, in this talk, which now spans uh, a number of years. Um, I do want to highlight the contributions of Dr. Yuji Xiao, who is a, a postdoctoral scholar in, uh, in my research group right now and is on the market for faculty positions. So if you are aware of, um, of a great position, please let us know. So here's an outline for the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to give kind of a brief refresher on thermal emission for those of you that aren't exactly in the field. 
Um, then we'll talk about precision thermal emission measurements under challenging conditions, where challenging either means that there's something strange going on with temperature, or perhaps your thermal emitter is not in equilibrium. Uh, then I'll discuss a new technique that we uh, came up with in our group based on the fact that we can now do some of these precision thermal emission measurements, which is called depth thermography, essentially measuring temperature using infrared radiation beneath the surface of materials instead of just on the surface of the material. Um, I'll talk a little bit about temperature tunable optical materials for thermal emission engineering, essentially to create temperature tunable emissivity. And in order to do that, we utilize materials with uh, phase transitions, such as vanadium dioxide and samarium nickel oxide and others. And uh, using one of these materials, I'll show you that we can make a zero differential thermal emitter, which is kind of a, uh, a strange type of coating or a strange device. And then I'll conclude by discussing temporal control of thermal emissivity, including what I think is the fastest ever uh, modulation of emissivity that um, has been experimentally demonstrated. Okay, so first, a, a brief refresher on thermal emission. So here's, uh, here it is in the context of black bodies. Um, in general, the spectrum and intensity of thermal radiation that's emitted by a black body is given by Planck's law and can be integrated to yield the Stefan-Boltzmann law over here. So the integration over all wavelengths, all angles, and so forth. And Planck's law states that the spectrum of thermal radiation, in this case from a black body, uh, has this shape and the peak of this shape shifts to shorter wavelengths with higher temperatures, but at every wavelength, the higher the temperature, the more thermal emission comes out. And so when you integrate this over all wavelengths, you get the irradiance as a function of temperature. In this case, uh, we're plotting this in Celsius, but uh, this temperature of the fourth over here is in Kelvin, and you have a, a nice sharp increase with the amount of thermal radiation that is emitted as a function of temperature. So uh, Planck's law and uh, the Stefan-Boltzmann law of thermal radiation give us this general intuition that hotter objects emit more light than colder objects. And that's true whether or not you have a black body. In this case, the amount of power is just directly proportional to temperature to the fourth, where temperature is in absolute units like Kelvin or Rankine or something else. Um, but even for any sort of realistic objects where the emissivity is not one and it's not a black body, you still have a relationship that looks kind of like this, where you have the amount of uh, thermally emitted power, which is also at least roughly proportional to temperature to the fourth. I say roughly because this emissivity may be slightly temperature dependent and often is slightly temperature dependent in a lot of materials. But regardless, both for black bodies and for real objects, and whether you're integrating over all wavelengths or only over certain wavelength ranges, like for example, these windows in the mid infrared, the hotter an object is, the more thermal radiation comes out. And of course, we use this all the time in thermography and infrared imaging and many other applications. Um, and this relationship kind of uh, tells you that for a particular type of object, there's a one-to-one -one map between the temperature of that object as a function of position and the thermal power, because of course temperature and power are directly related. And so this is why infrared cameras work and you can use them to image temperature distributions. So uh, here is a, an example of uh, infrared thermography. So this is, uh, these are a couple infrared images that we took with uh, a mid-infrared microbolometer camera of uh, our family dog, Toby. This is Toby. Um, so you can see that uh, Toby is uh, quite warm. You know, this is kind of dog body temperature, although mediated slightly by the fact that there's fur all around, except when you look at the nose, you see that the nose is at room temperature or even a little bit colder than room temperature. This is a result of evaporative cooling. Um, dogs lick their noses and then uh, that evaporates, cooling down their noses. That's, uh, I think, useful for uh, for, uh, for their sense of smell. Um, and so uh, you can see that directly on these infrared features. Okay, so um, over the last couple of decades, there's been a resurgence of uh, interest in the science and engineering of thermal emission. Uh, thermal emission is actually a very old topic. It goes back uh, you know, something like over 100 years uh, to, to Kirchhoff and Planck and, and, and Boltzmann. Uh, but over the last uh, 20 years, there's been kind of a a lot of interest in using the tools of nanophotonics, the, the, the tools of nanophotonics engineering to engineer thermal radiation because of the correspondence between uh, thermal emission parameters like the emissivity and optical and optics parameters such as optical absorptivity. And uh, if you're interested in kind of the, the, the range of research that has happened over the last couple of decades in uh, the nanophotonic engineering of thermal emitters, uh, we published a paper last year in 2019 in Nature Materials reviewing uh, uh, I think this has something like 140 or 150 citations uh, reviewing a lot of the progress in this area. So I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. Okay, so uh, what are the opportunities to engineer thermal emission? So in general, the, spectral, uh, the spectrum of thermal emission is given by uh, 
this Planck log like body contribution, which is dependent on wavelength and dependent on temperature and then a bunch of constants, but it's also dependent on the emissivity, which is this parameter that's between zero and one that tells you uh, how likely is the object to emit a photon thermally. So what is the propensity of the object to emit? And this emissivity can be a function of wavelength, but as you'll see in a second, it can also be a function of many, many other things, and that's useful for engineering. Uh, essentially, the ellipses over here is hiding all of the engineering degrees of freedom of, uh, of emissivity. And so those degrees of freedom can include directionality, so what's the direction of emission, the polarization, temperature, applied field, and so forth. And a very famous result that's easily derived from basic thermodynamics considerations is this uh, Kirchhoff's law of thermal radiation, which states that the emissivity is exactly equivalent for objects that are reciprocal and in equilibrium to optical absorptivity, which means that if you know how to, how to engineer optical absorption, for example, by nanostructuring, by having plasmonic resonators, by, uh, by having uh, electric thin films and so forth. If you can engineer this optical absorptivity, you can also engineer the emissivity. And that's very, very useful. However, in some instances, the emissivity can also be undefined, um, or rather both the temperature and the emissivity of a thermal emitter might be undefined. Uh, one example of this is if your thermal emitter comprises many, many different, uh, uh, many different regions, each one at a different temperature, then you can't assign a single temperature and you also can't assign a single emissivity. And so um, I'll show you a couple examples of this kind of, uh, this kind of behavior later on in the talk. But uh, long story short, um, one thing that you need to be able to do this kind of science and engineering is the experimental capability to measure thermal emission very, very well. And this is important for uh, infrared camouflage applications and thermal regulation and fundamental studies and so forth. And so that's the first thing I want to talk about is what kind of experimental capability do you need to do good measurements of thermal emission where good means both accurate and precise and uh, can handle a, a variety of rather challenging experimental um, experimental situations. So um, I'm an optics experimentalist, and for an optics experimentalist, uh, the concept of measuring thermal emission sounds like it should be really easy. Conceptually, it's very straightforward. You take a sample and you put it, uh, for example, on a temperature controller so that you can change the temperature whatever, to whatever you want, you know, 100 degrees, 200 degrees, 50 degrees room temperature, and so forth. You send the output into a spectrometer. Um, in this case, in the mid-infrared, we typically use the Fourier transform infrared spectrometers, or FTIRs, because of uh, their multi complex advantage compared to, for example, grading-based spectrometers. Then you take a reference sample, for example, something that's like a black body, something very black, like a, a carbon nanotube forest. You do the same measurement. You compare the two together. You perhaps divide one by the other, and you have, uh, for example, the emissivity. So this sounds like it should be very easy. This is a set of equipment that we kind of collected and then built up in our lab. This is our FTIR, our FTR microscope, a uh, heat stage that can be placed in various places, including under the microscope and also uh, in the sample compartment of the FTIR, where we can also rotate it to do angle dependent measurements. So conceptually, this is all very, very straightforward. The question is, is it actually straightforward? And the answer is not exactly, because the data analysis of these kind of measurements have to account for thermal emission from not just the sample, but also from the detector, from the optics. You have to take into account the frequency dependent response of the instrument. Um, it's not necessarily trivial to obtain and characterize a good reference. Um, often references are temperature dependent or have sharp spectral features that need to be accounted for. So this is overall not as simple as it sounds. Um, it requires a lot of care. So let me show you an example of this, something that we found very, very strange when we first started doing these measurements uh, some years ago, uh, and we finally resolved over the last couple of years, and we know what's going on now, but let me show you. So here's a very, very simple example. This is the spectral intensity. It's in arbitrary units because we are not normalizing to anything. We're not using a reference or anything. So spectral intensity as a function of wavelength for a particular temperature of a carbon nanotube forest, which is about as close as you can get to a laboratory black body. It has very, very high emissivity, almost one across a very broad range of wavelengths. It's very black in the visible, it's very black in the infrared and so forth. So this is for all intents and purposes a black body. So we put this black body right here, we send it into our FTR spectrometer, we, uh, met, we um, uh, measure what the detector sees, and then we Fourier transform that to obtain this uh, spectral intensity versus wavelength. Of course, it also has the frequency dependent uh, uh, kind of transfer function of the, uh, of the spectrometer and the detector and so forth um, inside of this as well. So this isn't really the emission spectrum, it's something similar. So this is at 30 degrees. So um, I'm going to ask kind of a rhetorical question um, since I think everybody's muted, but uh, what do you think happens when you decrease the temperature? 
Um, and the straightforward answer is, well, of course, the lower the temperature, the less thermal emission comes out. This is uh, very well understood and very well known, and it is, in fact, what we see. So if you decrease the temperature from 30 to 25 degrees, the amount of thermal emission goes down. Now, if you keep going, you see the same thing, 24 degrees, 23, 22, 21, 20 degrees, and then something strange happens. You go down to 19 degrees, to 18, to 17, to 16, and all of a sudden the measured thermal emission is going back up again. And so if you get down to 10 degrees, it almost makes it uh, all the way back to the amount of thermal emission that was coming out with 30. So this is very, very strange. It's really a kind of a bizarre experimental observation and something that we knew immediately was um, wrong, but we didn't know why for a long time. And once we figured it out, it actually became kind of a, a an interesting experimental quirk that was uh, that was worth publishing and worth talking about. So we describe what's happening in this uh, Physical Review of Applied publication in 2019. If you integrate over here, so if you integrate over all wavelengths and you get the total intensity and you plot it as a function of temperature, you see that there's this minimum over here and the minimum in our experiment at least is just a few degrees below room temperature. And we actually went to our physical plant to the folks that maintain our lab and we asked them to change the temperature of our lab room, which turned out to be more difficult than um, one would expect. And we observed that this minimum over here followed the temperature of the room. Uh, so it was always like some degree, some number of degrees um, lower than the temperature of the room. And so clearly this is some sort of an artifact. So here's what we found out. Um, our system is a little bit more complex than just um, the sample in the spectrometer. In particular, we have the sample over here. And then after the interferometer, we also have a bunch of optical components. We have apertures and filters and things like that before this, uh, the uh, optical signal makes it all the way into the, um, into the detector. And what we found out is that many things in this uh, spectrometer were thermally emitting. So the Beam splitter was a potential source of thermal radiation. The detector was a potential source of thermal radiation. But in particular, the biggest contributor, the one that we turned that it turned out was causing all of the problems, were the optical components that were between the interferometer and the detector that were emitting backward. So they were thermally emitting in the backward direction, and then this light would kind of bounce off the interferometer, make it all the way back, and make it into the detector. And so it turns out that this negative propagation contribution is what causes this a decrease, apparent decrease in the signal as you increase the temperature and then uh, an increase back up again as you decrease the temperature some more. So um, I can show you a little bit more details about how that works. So an FTIR doesn't actually measure the spectrum directly. An FTIR measures uh, kind of a detector reading as a function of mirror location where the mirror location is the position of this mirror in a Michelson interferometer. And so what we found is if we looked at the signal at high temperature and then at low temperature, the interferogram was actually out of phase. So every time you had a peak in the interferogram at high temperature, you had a dip in the interferogram at low temperature. And by looking at which part of the interferogram was staying constant and which part was changing as a function of temperature of our sample, what we observed is that actually the sample contribution was increasing always with temperature like we would expect, but then there was this cancellation that was happening with the background um, as a result of the background emission from the optical components, and they were kind of effectively canceling out on the interferometer, which we found quite strange because, of course, these are all incoherent effects. This is, not, uh, uh, this is not some sort of destructive interference phenomenon that's happening. This is, uh, in, in this case, it's that the interferograms are out of phase rather than the optical waves are out of phase. Um, and so you can see that in a little bit more detail. I'm not going to go through this uh, uh, kind of with, uh, with, with a great uh, degree of, um, of detail, but actually this phase inversion of the interferogram, it turns out, uh, was not known in the nanophotonics literature, uh, but it was known uh, going all the way to the 90s in remote sensing literature, although um, there wasn't really a general argument that was given, and we found that a general argument was actually very, very simple. So if you have a source that's kind of a forward emitting source, a Michelson interferometer and a detector over here at an FTIR, and then you also have a negative emitting source, this backward emitting source, which in our case were our apertures and filters and so forth, and you make some very, very simple assumptions. For example, that the interferometer is lossless and that it's also symmetric, which means that the transition, transmission through the interferometer is the same in one direction as in another direction. You can simply do some incoherent addition of the fields, forward field, the backward field, the backward field reflected, the forward field transmitted, and you find that there's actually a negative sign over here, which means that your total signal on the detector is going to be close to zero when the forward source and backward source have very, very similar intensities. And of course, when your sample is at low temperatures, for example, 30 degrees, 20 degrees, and your entire instrument is close, is close to room temperature, even you, the person standing next to the instrument, is close to room temperature a little bit higher, you can very easily get this kind of cancellation effect. 
And so uh, you just have to take, be able to take it into account and be able to predict um, that it's, when it's going to happen in order to understand your thermal emission measurements. So um, that long story kind of summarized, uh, after you uh, properly calibrate your instrument and properly uh, do your data analysis, we can now measure thermal emission and particularly emissivity of objects with very, very high precision and very high accuracy, even down to low temperatures. And as you'll see, even with uh, non-equilibrium thermal emitters and other kind of more complicated uh, scenarios. So here is kind of, is a reference. This is the emissivity at an angle, it's unpolarized emissivity at an angle of 10 degrees versus wavelength of a fused silica wafer. This is one of the references that we like to use to make sure our instrument is working. The dotted lines are the direct emission measurement that I just described to you. And and then the solid line is very, very careful spectroscopic lipsometry plus the application of Kirchhoff's law, which you can do easily in this case, but is more difficult in other cases. And you can see that they line up almost exactly. So uh, we're very confident that uh, we can have kind of vanishingly small error bars um, on, our, uh, on our emissivity measurements at this point, which uh, has enabled us to do a lot of things, some of which I'll show you in just a second. So before I get into that, I want to mention that we have a paper out just uh, last month in June in Laser and Photonics Reviews. It doesn't have a, a, like a volume number or anything yet, but it's also um, on archive as of last year. And these are guidelines for thermal emission measurements. So we spent uh, a long time writing a very long paper, uh, probably one of the longest papers um, I've ever been a part of, uh, to try to explain how to do thermal emission measurements in a whole uh, variety of cases based on our experience going back over the last five years. And so this is a flow chart from this paper. Um, so if you ever found yourself uh, with difficulties doing thermal emission measurements, I re recommend you check it out. So for example, you want to do a thermal emission measurement, you can ask, is your thermal emitter in equilibrium or not? If it is, you, you know, is the net back, uh, background negligible or not? And so forth and provide a bunch of different techniques of how to do these, um, these measurements um, as easily as possible and yet still have them be very accurate and very precise. So that's uh, in this paper down below. Okay. So now that we can do these measurements that are very accurate and very precise, um, even for non-equilibrium emitters, um, what interesting things can we do with them? So here is one example. This is uh, something that uh, we, uh, we published um, this year in ACS Photonics. It's a technique that we called depth thermography. So thermography is the use of infrared imaging to measure temperature, to do remote measurements of temperature. And depth thermography is uh, a very similar technique that uh, enables the measurement of temperature, not just at the surface of objects, but also as a function of depth. So in certain circumstances, and granted those circumstances are rather limited, but in certain limited circumstances, we can take an object and we can do a thermal emission measurement. So we can measure the spectrum of thermal emission that comes out and we can do a temperature retrieval where we essentially invert that spectrum, compare it to a model, do some fitting and find the temperature, not just at the top of, uh, surface of the object, but also as a function of depth. And so the way that to understand this um, is actually quite straightforward, and you can see it in this diagram over here. Essentially, anything that's thermally emitted from the top surface is not going to be attenuated anymore. It's just going to be propagating through free space, and eventually it hits your spectrometer. Anything that is emitted from depth, if you have an ob if you have a material that has some amount of uh, some amount of optical loss, it's kind of a semi-transparent material. Uh, some of that thermal emission is going to be attenuated before that uh, thermal emission makes it into your spectrometer. However, that attenuation is going to have a uh, wavelength dependence because any lossy material has some sort of dispersion associated with it and some sort of uh, loss as a function, uh, as a function of, uh, of wavelength. And therefore, by looking at the spectrum, you should be able to figure out uh, what the temperature is at different points along the depth. So I think we have the first question. So I'm going to quickly look at that. Uh, so here's a question. Many of us use thermal cameras to perform temperature measurements of surfaces based on your work. What cautions can you offer, especially for materials whose emissivity is poorly known? Um, this is a very tough question, um, actually, and one of uh, the things that we are uh, working on uh, in a variety of projects. Um, I, I guess the, the most straightforward thing, which of course you're aware of, uh, this question is from Henry Everett, um, is uh, to try to know your emissivity as well as possible. And if you don't know it, um, try to uh, try to figure it out. So if you have access, for example, to a uh, uh, to a hyperspectral camera, you can, um, and, and some references, you can kind of do a comparison and you can try to measure the emissivity. Um, I will say that there are um, other, there are other things that you can do. For example, if you're 
uh, if you're using an infrared camera and to, to measure temperature as a function of position of an unknown surface, um, you can try to use a, a reference with a known emissivity placed in the same exact position, for example, if it's close to a heater or on a wall or something, um, so that you can essentially calibrate your camera something with a known emissivity. This is also not that tr uh, trivial because you have to be quite careful um, to make sure that your thermal contact is very, very similar between your reference and your actual sample. And also, for example, the thickness and thermal conductivity of the samples are comparable. So we've had a number of situations where we have a sample that's thick and has a thermal conductivity that's not as high as one might want, either in our reference or in something that we're measuring, and then you have a temperature drop. So this is, can be quite challenging. So I guess um, the main caution I, or, or the main uh, advice I can provide is to always keep in mind that um, this is something that you have to calibrate for and so use some sort of known um, references uh, in, in the, the situation essentially in a setup that's as close as possible to what you're actually measuring so that you can calibrate um, your measurements. The other thing is if you have access to infrared spectrometers, um, I would recommend occasionally sticking your sample in an infrared spectrometer to try to understand what the emissivity is. And that doesn't have to be a thermal emission measurement. So Kirchhoff's law applies to many, many objects. And so if you do uh, reflection or transmission measurements, then you can, um, um, then you can um, uh, get a pretty good idea of what the emissivity is without having to do thermal emission measurements. So there's another question that came up here, uh, which is what emissivity standards do you use? Um, so uh, there are a few that we use on a regular basis. So uh, the one that's the most like a black body is a vertically oriented carbon nanotube forest. So you can actually buy these. You can, uh, if, if you want to send me a quick email afterward, I can dig up the company that sells the ones that we have. We can buy, we buy kind of centimeter squares of vertically oriented carbon nanotube forest grown on silicon for a couple hundred bucks. Um, in my experience, if you're doing things in the visible or near infrared, uh, the thickness, do it doesn't have to be that thick, but if you're going to do this in the mid infrared uh, up to about 50 microns, you actually want the thickness to be something like two, three, 400 microns um, of, of kind of a dense carbon nanotube forest in order for it to be really quite a bit like a black body. Um, but that, that can be a little bit challenging um, because uh, also carbon nanotube forests can also be a little bit uneven and can be a little bit scattering. So in addition to these black body type references, we also uh, have a couple of standards that we're very used to in the lab just because we've measured them over and over and over again. And you probably will see them pop up uh, throughout my talk, which is we use uh, sapphire and we use a uh, few silica wafers. Um, and so those can be polished so then you don't have any sort of scattering or any sort of roughness uncertainty. And then as long as you know very, very well what the emissivity is, you can use them as references. There are a few issues with those. One of them is that both of those materials and actually any material with vibrational resonances uh, has emissivity that is dependent on temperature. Not too dependent, but is dependent. And so you have to know what that temperature dependence is if you're going to have a, a large dynamic range of temperatures if you want very precise measurements. And also those samples have sharp features in the spectrum uh, as a result of vibrational resonances, kind of optical phonons and things like that. And that's very useful to make sure that your measurement is working, but it's also potentially troublesome because if you divide by something that has a sharp feature, you can get that feature in your, um, in your uh, normalized measurement if you're not very careful. So, so uh, my best advice is actually to use multiple references. So if you really want to be confident, use a black body reference and use then two references that you know very, very well, in our case, Fusilica and Sapphire. And once you do all of that, um, you kind of end up with an unambiguous answer if all of them agree. So that's my, um, that's kind of my general advice. Okay, so, um, so this is the, the basic concept of depth thermography, right? The, the, the trying to retrieve the, the temperature based on the thermal emission spectrum that you measure. So let me show you uh, how that works. So this is one of these references that we use all of the time in our lab, um, Fusilica. Fusilica turned out to be a really good kind of test sample for depth thermography because it has, uh, it's semi-transparent in the mid infrared. Here's the propagation depth versus wavelength for our Fusilica wafer. And it has very low thermal conductivity, which means that if you put the sample on a heater stage, you are gonna have a gradient of temperature temperatures from the hot stage down here to the air up here. It's going to be colder up here by at least a few degrees if you have a one millimeter fused silica wafer, as I'll show you in just a second. So the idea here is just you put this uh, sample on the heater and you measure the thermal emission, and then you try to invert that thermal emission spectrum to figure out what the underlying temperature distribution is. So here is uh, kind of how this works. So once we've obtained the measurement, we build a model 
and we build a model which uh, is essentially, uh, in this case, just one solid block of material. This is just few silica, but we're saying that uh, it's made up of a bunch of different uh, layers and each one is at a slightly different temperature. And we can use the fluctuation dissipation theorem to essentially calculate what is the total thermal emission from this object, which is now a non-equilibrium object because you can't assign a sing single temperature to it. Each layer has a different temperature and each layer is semi-transparent. So some of the thermal emission from the bottom goes through this colder region and then eventually emerges. And so we can in principle predict what we would expect to see in such a case. And then we can also do these experiments. And let me show you the experiment. The experiment is kind of a, a tour de force, um, a kind of a hero experiment from, uh, from Yuja, the postdoc in uh, working uh, in, in, in my group to do some of these measurements. So here is the spectral radiance that's measured, um, now normalized to a, to a reference as a function of wavelength. And the experiment is done at a temperature of uh, 300 degrees. And so you can see the experiment over here is a perfect 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 match to two different theories but if you zoom in all the way over here over here on the left below about six microns or maybe uh, below about five and a half microns you see that the experiment which is this red curve over here is dead on one of our uh, theoretical calculations but deviates slightly from another uh, one of our theoretical calculations so this theoretical calculation in blue that's labeled uniform temperature is essentially assuming that every one of these layers is at the same temperature so this is kind of your typical assumption of thermal emission measurements whereas this black line over here is a, a spectrum uh, that's calculated from this kind of model where we assume different temperatures. And so from that, from this tiny difference that's hidden within uh, this little region of the spectrum in which you have to zoom in to be able to see it, from that we can do a temperature extraction where we say, okay, so uh, at, the, at the very top surface, the temperature is indeed uh, almost 300. It's a little bit lower. Uh, sorry, this is all the way at the bottom. At the bottom, we have a temperature that's almost 300, which is what you would expect because that's the heater temperature. But when you get to the surface at a depth of zero, you have a temperature that's in this case about 282, 283 uh, degrees Celsius because of course there's a, a thermal conduction through the surface and the air is colder than the heater underneath. And so this is the, these are the results of this retrieval. So the green line is what we assume to be true based on kind of straightforward calculations with thermal conductivity. And then the, uh, the symbols are our extraction algorithm. So this is something that we can do now, uh, which I thought was very, very cool. Of course, it requires very precise calibration and a very good signal to noise. So this is kind of challenging and presently also requires knowledge of the optical properties of materials. So you have to really know what your, uh, what your material is and what its complex refractive index is. Although uh, we have some ideas on how to overcome this limitation and we're uh, working on that now. So let me pause for a second and take a couple of questions. Um, so a uh, question from uh, Peter, are the oscillations in the experiment noise or due to physics? So uh, this is, um, I, I'm guessing you're talking about these oscillations right here. This is just due to noise. Um, although, uh, well, okay, I should be careful. So there are two contributions. There is noise, but also in this range, you have atmospheric absorption due to CO2 uh, and water vapor. Um, in this case, uh, this would be, uh, there is a possibility of some water vapor lines. We think that this is mostly noise, but there, uh, because we tried very hard to get rid of all of our um, water uh, water lines uh, in, in normalizing, but it's possible that there is a tiny bit of fluctuation due to uh, water absorption as well. So it's probably a combination. I think it's mostly noise, um, but it is small enough that uh, the effect doesn't seem to affect us. This is not physics from the uh, from the material itself. If it is physics, it's physics just from the from the atmosphere, from, from the atmospheric absorption and emission. Yeah, so uh, even though right now uh, what we've done is uh, this kind of inversion for a very, very simple system for just a few silica wafer, nothing fancy, uh, we think that with a little bit more work and a little bit more uh, data processing and some knowledge of the material properties of what you're looking at, um, we think that we'll be able to do this uh, for, for example, semiconductor devices, trying to look underneath the surface of semiconductor devices to find hotspots. And we're also quite excited um, and have uh, done some work in trying to essentially measure temperature throughout the volume of high temperature gases and uh, high temperature molten salts. So in particular, we're looking at some molten salts that are candidates for generation four nuclear reactors. Uh, it's where it's very difficult to put in temperature probes inside the volume because of very high temperatures and very corrosive environments. And we're hoping that we can you can use this to kind of do tomography of temperature as a function of volume. So we'll see how that goes um, in the future. Okay, 
So uh, moving to a slightly uh, different topic, uh, which is, oh, I'm sorry, let me try to answer one more question. Um, if the sample, this is from uh, Sivaram, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. If the sample has voids or cracks, how do you get the thermal profile? Can you get a map? Um, so right now we can't. So uh, right now this measurement, uh, sorry, this method has been kind of calibrated and verified with um, only rather smooth samples that don't have a lot of spatial features. Um, I suspect it'll be quite hard if the sample has um, voids that are un in unpredictable places or cracks. Uh, we'll see what happens. We are hoping that we will be able to combine depth thermography with some uh, other techniques, some other imaging and spectroscopy techniques. And then if you kind of combine that information, we're hoping that you'll be able to get a temperature map. But right now the answer is no, we cannot. Um, I certainly don't know how to do it. Okay, so um, now that we discussed a little bit of about kind of measurement and what that can enable, I want to spend some time talking about engineering. So again, the intensity and spectrum of thermal radiation depends on this black body contribution and also depends on this emissivity, which I mentioned could depend on a whole bunch of different degrees of freedom, whether it's wavelength, directionality, polarization, and so forth. The degree of freedom I want to focus on right now is temperature. Um, so it's quite interesting to think about engineering objects with temperature dependent emissivity where that temperature dependent emissivity changes fast enough with temperature to either counterbalance or even flip over this black body contribution which has a fixed temperature dependence that you can never change. Um, and so you can imagine that if for example this uh, temperature dependence of this emissivity changes fast enough you could have something like non-monotonic thermal emission where you keep increasing the temperature but the thermal emission doesn't necessarily always go up. It goes up and then down and down and up and down and so forth. Um, and in particular, if you wanted to do something like that, you need materials that have temperature tunable optical properties that are very, very temperature tunable. So you change the temperature a little bit and your optical properties change a lot uh, because the black body contribution changes very quickly with temperature. And so if this is not the case, if this is, for example, a piece of silicon where, which is gradually changing uh, with temperature because of uh, filling of the conduction band as a function of temperature, this effect is essentially negligible. You can treat the emissivity as more or less a constant. And so we need materials where the emissivity is decidedly not constant as a function of temperature. So um, in my group, and even uh, even before that, when I was a, uh, when I was a PhD student in Federico Capasso's group, going going back now uh, seven or eight years, um, we've done a lot of work with uh, in collaboration with uh, Shreemar Manathan's group and some others on the use of complex oxides to do just this. So here's an example of the most famous complex oxide that has temperature tunable uh, electronic and optical properties, uh, vanadium dioxide, which when you heat it up past about 70 degrees C, undergoes this dramatic enormous phase transition, which changes both the crystal structure, um, and this is of course reversible, the band structure, the electrical resistance, and also the optical properties. Now this material has been very, very widely studied. It's one of the, uh, more famous uh, materials of this type. I think it's the most famous complex oxide uh, with, phase, with a phase transition um, and has had the most publications on it uh, going back to about 1960. However, um, its use for optics has been uh, an occasion a challenge because anytime you look up the optical properties of vanadium dioxide in a publication, you get a different answer. So if you pull up what, one data set, you, you, you plot it, you get something. If you get a, take another data set and you plot it, you get something else. And you can never quite be confident and you can never do design and simulations and really be sure that it's going to represent your experiment very well. So we uh, thought a few years ago that we need to fix this, at least for ourselves, if not for the whole community. And so we spent a lot of time doing spectroscopic lipsometry going all the way from the UV about 200 nanometers to the far infrared about 30 microns and doing the, this analysis of, um, uh, of vanadium dioxide films. So in this case we're plotting the NNK, the real and imaginary part before the phase transition and after the phase transition across this whole range. And what you find is that at mid-infrared wavelengths, uh, which, is where we're which is where we're interested in for the thermal emission work, VO2 transitions from being kind of a more or less a transparent dielectric to a lossy dielectric all the way to a lossy uh, very lossy metal. And so this can be used as a widely tunable optical material, provided that you can tolerate the loss in the metallic state and the intermediate state. And of course, that's okay, totally okay for thermal emission engineering. And so this is something that we um, have been using a lot. Um, I should mention that uh, all of these data sets um, that we took, uh, a lot more than I'm showing over here, uh, are published in the supplementary information of this paper in Analender Physik. Uh, 
uh, published last year. And so you can just go to the supplementary, copy and paste this big table, plop it into your own simulations, and you can use it. And you have the data all the way from 200 nanometers to 30 microns. Now, as I mentioned, um, VO2 is kind of famously finicky as far as its dependence on deposition conditions, on even like who deposited it, what technique did you use, what is the substrate, what is the thickness, and so forth. And so we wanted to get to the bottom of that. So we did a lot of comparisons, a couple of which are shown here. This is again in this paper. Uh, here is the NNK as a function of wavelength for sputtered films versus sol gel, but on the same substrate and the same thickness. Here we're keeping everything constant except the substrate is silicon or sapphire. And we do many of these comparisons. And one of the things that we found which is um, very compelling to me, is that anytime you look below about two microns, you see that every sample is a little different. You cannot trust somebody else's data set um, uh, for your own VO2 that you're growing in your lab or you're using in your lab every time you have a change. And that's because the band structure is very, very sensitive to uh, the deposition conditions and to strain and things like that. And the same thing is true but, uh, at longer wavelengths than about 10, no, than about 11 or 12 microns. Um, and that's because uh, the uh, vibrational features of VO2 are very sensitive to, uh, again, to strain and to the, the substrate and so forth. But there is this magic region between about two microns and 11 microns where every curve that we measured is more or less the same, is quite, quite similar. And that's because you're far away from the interband transition and you're far away from the vibrational transitions. And so not only do you have a region in the insulating state where the material is quite low loss, which is potentially useful for some applications, but also pretty much every Every VO2 film that you deposit is going to behave very, very similarly as far as its optical properties. We even deposited one film where you couldn't see an, elect uh, an electrical transition at all because the film was so cracked and had so many voids, but the optical transition was almost exactly the same. So this is actually quite exciting because it means that all of a sudden you can use this literature data set, whether it's ours or from other people's measurements in the mid infrared between about two and 11 microns, and you can apply it to your own design and you can be reasonably confident that uh, the data set is representative of the material that you have in your own lab. Um, so we thought that was, that was exciting. Um, so uh, there's actually a zoo of complex oxides that have insulator to metal transitions that I think would be very exciting for thermal emission measurement. Just to give you an example from, uh, uh, from this review article um, from the Ramanathan group in 2011, um, there's uh, neodymium nicolate, which has a phase transition at 200 Kelvin. There is this uh, V407, this vanadium oxide that has a phase transition at 250. There is this uh, uh, titanium uh, oxide, uh, uh, TI-305 that has a transition at 450 Kelvin. So there's a, a zoo of materials that have not been explored for optics as far as I know and have not been explored for thermal emission engineering that we're very excited about. Uh, but we did start uh, looking at one other one, which is the samarium nickel oxide, which has a phase transition that's uh, at about 400 Kelvin. And uh, it's much more gradual than VO2, at least in our experiments, but still the change in optical properties is rather large as a function of, uh, as a function of temperature and you can use it for thermal emission engineering, although it's probably worse for uh, other type of optical engineering because it does not have a lossless state, unlike vanadium dioxide, which has a, a reasonably low loss state in the mid infrared. So uh, this data set, if you're interested in it, has been published um, uh, at the end of last year in this, uh, uh, in this paper in PNAS. So you can do some really fun stuff with some of these complex oxides. This is the very, very first thing that I did um, on this topic that really got me excited about this field. So this was still when I was, uh, when I was a graduate student at Harvard with uh, Federico Capasso in 2013. Um, over here, this was before we were able to do these really good, uh, precise and accurate thermal emission measurements. Um, and so the emitted power is in arbitrary units. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, here is a a thin film of VO2 on, on a sapphire substrate, and you can see that the emitted power, instead of kind of um, uh, increasing gradually as a function of temperature, as you would expect for a black body or a, a, typical, um, a typical surface, it reaches a local maximum, and then it has this sharp decrease, which is very, very strange. It means that when you point an infrared camera at this object, at 60 degrees, it looks kind of cooler, at 75 degrees, it looks hotter, and at 85 degrees, it looks colder than it did at 60 degrees, even though, of course, it's actually um, quite a bit hotter. And that's as a result of this negative differential region over here. So this got us quite excited at the time um, about the possibility of doing of uh, uh, this kind of thermal emission engineering for infrared camouflage, for passive radiative cooling, and things like that. Um, and uh, we've been able to do some of these things. So I'll show you in just a second some examples of infrared camouflage. And then there's a lot of uh, passive radiative cooling work that's being done uh, by other research groups, for example, Michelle Papanelli's group um, 
at the University of Southern California has been doing work on uh, kind of the use of, the, of this, these kind of features to be able to passively cool surfaces when they get too hot, they get they kind of cool back down. Um, we've done a lot of uh, kind of materials work as well. This is just kind of an advertisement of a paper from a few years ago where we uh, found an interesting way that, uh, that we can engineer the phase transition temperature of VO2 after the fact, so not during growth, but after the fact using focused ion beam by doing defect engineering and essentially changing the transition uh, from, uh, from 70 degrees all the way down to 25 degrees. And this is, of course, quite useful for thermal emission engineering uh, applications. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to do for a long time, ever since that 2013 paper, is to achieve full decoupling of temperature and thermal radiation. So I mentioned in the beginning in the introduction that for a particular fixed surface, you have this one-to-one -one relationship between temperature and thermal limited power, which means that you can use an infrared camera to see your temperature distributions. And we thought it would be very interesting to make kind of a privacy shield type of coding where a temperature distribution would map to nothing, to just a constant. Uh, uh, constant thermal emission distribution. In other words, you have a zero differential emitter because the derivative, um, essentially the slope of this curve is going to be zero. So um, here's kind of a, a visual example of the a visual representation of this. This is the thermal power versus temperature for a typical thermal emitter and then the zero differential emitter. And the only way that this can happen is if you look at, for example, the Stefan Boltzmann law, is if the emissivity, which can be as a function of temperature, decreases to exactly cancel out the t to the fourth increase. Um, and in that case, you have this zero differential, um, the zero differential effect. So fortunately, we've been able to implement this uh, using a, a thin fill of about 150 to 200 nanometers of uh, samarium nickel oxide uh, on a sapphire substrate. And here is an experimental measurement. So this is the emissivity versus wavelength versus temperature measured a couple different ways. So this is uh, the measurements are not quite as perfect as uh, we have now because they were actually done before we figured out all of the final details of our um, thermal emission measurements, but still they're quite accurate. And you can see that the emissivity decreases gradually as a function of temperature. Um, actually, the rate of this decrease is almost perfect because we want to almost exactly cancel out this temperature of the fourth dependence, and it turns out that this is just right. So when you integrate, um, sorry, when you integrate this curve over wavelength and you get the total radiance versus, now you can see the units are, uh, well defined, uh, the radiance versus temperature, you can see that there's this region for the zero differential emitter from about 100 degrees to about 135 degrees where uh, the curve is completely flat. So no matter what the temperature is, the amount of thermal emission is the same or the emitted power is the same. And you can see that in this experiment over here where we took a, a little circular heat stage and we took the sample and we taped it with Kapton tape on, on the edge. We heated this, the, uh, the heater to 130 degrees. And because the sample is essentially kind of hanging off um, in air, it's hotter here, but it's colder here. And so here's an infrared image of kind of a typical object, which is not zero differential. In this case, it's just a piece of sapphire. And you can see that it's hotter here and cooler here, and it has a gradient in between. And you don't see this gradient at all in the zero differential uh, case, because essentially, even though there is a temperature gradient, there is also kind of an inverse gradient in emissivity. And so when you multiply the uh, the Planck distribution multiplied by the emissivity, you get a constant as a function of position um, all the way down across the sample. And so we thought this was quite exciting because um, you could imagine concealing infrared signatures using this approach, kind of uh, taking, for example, this train car that has something hot on the inside. In this case, it's actually radioactive material um, that's on the inside and uh, coating it with a surf with a coating that um, makes the total amount of thermal radiation constant. So we think that it's kind of a compelling um, Maybe camouflage is not exactly the right term, but kind of a privacy shield uh, type of coding. Okay, so in the last few minutes that I have, I wanted to show you one more thing, which is the uh, uh, temporal modulation of emissivity. So um, I mentioned before that any spectrum of thermal radiation is going to have a, uh, a black body contribution and this emissivity, and the emissivity can depend on many, many things. One of the things we haven't talked about yet is time. Can you do temporal modulation of emissivity? And of course, the answer is yes. And we're certainly not the first people that did this. There have been a lot of, um, or a number of works that have modulated the emissivity as a function of time. Uh, you can even go back decades uh, to satellite cooling technologies, which use um, 
essentially Venetian blind radiators where you can rotate a, a Venetian blind to a kind of a, a more emissive or a less emissive um, configuration. Uh, but of course, that's very, very slow. And so what we wanted to do is uh, try to set essentially a world record, modulate the emissivity as fast as possible. So this is work that was done in collaboration with Alberto Piquet's group at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, it was very, very simple conceptually. So we took some samples, which in our case were just undoped wafers um, of uh, silicon or gallium arsenide. We pump this thing with uh, high energy femtosecond pulses in the visible. So in this case, it's about 550 nanometers. And then we sent the output um, of the sample, which was sitting on a heater stage into a mid infrared detector with some filters through it. And what we were able to observe was that the power versus time uh, could be modulated quite significantly. So in this case, uh, the, the pulse is just a femtosecond pulse. So on this axis, it's, it's just right here and you can't see it at all. And uh, you can see the power versus time for different pulse energies and a particular temperature in this case of, of the, the, to which you're heating the gallium arsenide wafer. And you can see this nanosecond pulse and then this decay. So essentially what's happening here is at first the gallium arsenide is undoped and therefore the emissivity is very low and the amount of uh, thermally emitted power is essentially zero. You hit this thing with a pump pulse, you promote a bunch of carriers to the conduction band, your emissivity changes a lot, and you have this peak in thermal emission. And then as the free carriers recombine after a few nanoseconds, you have a decrease in thermal emission and then eventually a recovery. In this case, also hidden in this uh, measurement is a, a kind of a, a much narrower hot carrier pulse that's just a, a few picoseconds wide that is essentially convolved with everything else because our detector only has a time scale of about one nanosecond. So in this case, you're actually measuring not only an emissivity modulation, but also a temperature modulation due to hot carriers in, um, in the sample. But nevertheless, we actually do see both effects and we can model them very, very well. So these dotted lines are a, a model that we put together that takes into account um, uh, uh, essentially carrier generation, carrier generation as a function of depth, uh, the temperature as a function of depth, the, cha the uh, changes in optical properties as a function of depth, and as a result, what the overall uh, um, what the overall thermal emission uh, as a function of time is. We're also able to calculate the spectrum, although I'm not showing that here. So uh, as far as we know, this is the fastest ever modulation of emissivity by a factor of about a thousand, faster than uh, previous demonstrations that were based on electrical tuning of um, quantum wells. It's also quite an interesting and unique method of generating infrared pulses. So typically, if you want to convert visible pulses into the emitted infrared, you would use like a an optical parametric oscillator or an optical parametric amplifier, and your um, your output power would scale, for example, with the input power uh, very quickly because it's a nonlinear interaction. In this case, the primary scaling is actually due to the temperature of the sample. Um, and so the scaling is quite different, and this is not a conventional nonlinear process, although in effect, you are converting uh, visible pulses that are very short to mid-infrared pulses that are also short although of course much, much longer than the, the visible pulses. Okay, so I think I'm getting close to being out of time. I want to leave some time for a few more questions. So I'm just going to leave my outline or summary uh, slide here and uh, happy to take any more questions. Um, I, by the way, I'm also able, I think, to unmute people and so is Guru. So if you want to ask a question verbally, please just say so in the Q&A and we'll unmute you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, please, yeah. Uh, could, could anybody with questions, please go ahead. I see uh, there is a question by Henry. Yeah. Uh, so, Henry, so the, to, oh, sorry. Do you, do you want to read it or should I? Uh, Henry, do you want to speak? I think. Well, I wrote it, so you I wouldn't have to. But okay. Um, <laughs> but the question is twofold. Are, is there any angular dependence in the emissivity of the uh, ZDTE material you studied, and does the heat have to leak out? with heightened emissivity at other wavelengths to compensate for what you've suppressed? Uh, yeah, so um, of course, everything has angle dependence. Um, so yes, the emissivity is angle dependent, uh, dependent. Actually, the emissivity angle dependence is very small. And even though we do our measurements at over a range of different numerical apertures, so in some cases we do them at a numerical aperture that's very close to zero, so we're only collecting one angle. In other cases, we're using a numerical aperture of 0.4, which collects light up to an angle of, I think, 25, 24 degrees. I can't do, I can't do trigonometry in my head. Um, and uh, we've, we've done um, angle-dependent measurements as well, and the effect is very small. And the reason the effect is very small is actually a little bit subtle. So let me, 
Let me close this panel and go back to a slide that I hid. Give me one second. Um, so this used to be part of my talks, but um, is not anymore for the sake of time. Uh, but essentially, um, one thing that you, um, one thing that's quite interesting um, that uh, I, I've been looking at uh, for, for six or seven years now in various instances is the maximization of optical absorption and therefore the maximization of thermal emissivity in films that are very thin. Um, and so what we found is that um, you can very, um, you can very often have uh, situations, if you have a thin film that's much thinner than the wavelength on the right type of substrate, you can have potentially a very, very high degree of optical absorption, even though the film is much thinner than the optical wavelength, as long as you have high loss in the, in the thin film. And so in the case of these uh, zero differential thermal emitters, um, the samarium nickel oxide film is about 150 to 200 nanometers, and the wavelengths at which we're looking are about 8 to 14 microns. And so uh, and yet you still have this high emissivity at one temperature and a lower emissivity at another temperature and the effect works. But because the films are so thin compared to the wavelength, actually the uh, angle dependent effect is very small. So the angle dependence, you only really start seeing it at about 40 or 50 degrees off of norm, off normal um, for both P and S polarizations. And so uh, for all intents and purposes, um, the angle dependence is kind of negligible and we do neglect it most of the time. Uh, your second uh, part of the question is, does the heat have to leak out with heightened emissivity at other wavelengths? And the answer to that is no. It can, of course, depending on the material you use and what you do. In our case, it doesn't. Um, this is a little bit counterintuitive. It, it kind of feels like you might be violating some sort of uh, thermodynamic considerations, but it's actually not because what we're doing in, our, in all of our measurements, so for example, um, let me, let me go through this measurement. Um, let's say, uh, oops, sorry. Let's say this measurement over here um, is we're doing measurements not at constant uh, power that's being pumped into the sample, but we're doing these measurements at constant temperature. So we set our, uh, our, our heat stage to let's say a temperature of 120 degrees and we do a measurement. Then we change the temperature to 80 degrees and we do a measurement. And so essentially if the emissivity is decreasing for as the temperature is increasing, what that means is not that the, leak, the heat is leaking out at other, uh, at other wavelengths, it's that the uh, the uh, heat stage and the temperature controller are essentially pumping less heat into it to keep it at a certain temperature. So uh, essentially um, there aren't any kind of thermodynamic issues with it, but also you don't have uh, any, like an increase in emissivity at another wavelength to compensate. Okay, well, so you tricked me there, but if, if there was a way that you could um, do the measurement for a constant power instead of a constant temperature, would that still work or does it leak out somewhere else? Yeah, so we've done this not for the zero differential emitter, but for, um, I don't have it here, I don't think, sorry, one second, but let me pull it up. So we did do it uh, for these kind of samples. So this is a thin film of VO2 and sapphire. So this is a paper that we published a while ago, but actually um, a few years ago, we published a paper in collaboration with and led by Evelyn Wong's group at, um, at uh, MIT. And they, uh, they essentially put these samples into uh, into a chamber suspended on very, very thin legs so that you can essentially thermally isolate it in terms of conductivity from, uh, from the walls. And you pump in then a fixed, amount of, uh, a fixed amount of energy and you see what happens to the temperature and you can get really interesting phenomena like you essentially get a runaway. So this is the same kind of thing that happens for example, when an incandescent light bulb runs out, uh, burns out, where as your filament starts eroding, um, more and more energy is more and more energy is dissipated in the filament, and then it erodes more and more, and you kind of have catastrophic failure. So here you can have something similar, but with the sample just being very quickly like um, uh, sent into the uh, into the. Uh, uh, in, into the uh, high temperature state and then it doesn't come out and so you have this kind of catastrophic type runaway uh, condition so you can do these kind of measurements but we didn't do it in the zero differential uh, in the zero differential uh, sample yet really interesting. Yeah. To do it. thank you um, I think there is uh, one more question by Sivaram uh, how do you, how do you, can you uncloak the hidden ZDTE materials yeah. Yeah, so um, I should, okay, so I need to be a little bit careful um, because this feels like I should be able to call this a cloak, but I cannot. Uh, and the reason I cannot call it a cloak is because you still see it, right? So this thing is still going to emit 
some amount. It's just that the amount is not going to depend as a function of position on what the temperature is. And so um, one kind of application of this that we thought about is uh, some sort of textile, right? You, you, you make a coat or a pair of pants out of this, uh, with this coating on top and an infrared camera can't, for example, try to measure you know, your blood circulation or something like that. Maybe, maybe that's a, a very dystopian future that I'm, um, that I'm describing, but nevertheless. Um, but so the point is that this isn't cloaking, it is concealing of some information, concealing of position dependent information um, from an infrared camera. The, the question though is how do, you, um, how do you get around that? So if this is your defense, what is your offense? How do you find out information? So um, there are a few examples. Um, one of them is if you, if this is designed to work at a certain wavelength range, you could go to another wavelength range. So for example, in this case, the zero differential effect works really well at eight to 14 microns. But if you had like a three to five uh, micron camera or uh, infrared camera, the effect wouldn't be as strong and you'd be able to see something. Um, in this particular case, of course, you could then go back and try to engineer a zero differential coding at all wavelengths. Um, Another way to do this would be to either use filters in front or in, in front of your camera or have a hyperspectral camera, because at least right now, I didn't show it in detail, but the zero differential effect works really well when you integrate it over eight to 14. But if you integrate it like from eight to eight to 10, um, and then separately 10 to 14, you can actually see some changes. We are currently working on a coding that's actually zero differential kind of at every wavelength within a, within a, a wavelength bandwidth to try to get around that. Um, beyond that, I mean, there are other ways to measure temperature other than, um, other than thermal radiation. Not as many if you want to do it remotely at a distance, but for example, you could try to do Raman thermometry. Raman thermometry, of course, um, cannot be uh, fooled in this uh, type of uh, way. And you could imagine doing Raman thermometry, I guess, in like a standoff fashion, although I'm not familiar uh, with, with, with anybody working on that, uh, but that's also not my, my field. So just some other way of measuring temperature, I guess, is how you would get around this. Um, I guess I have uh, just one question, uh, which is related to the uh, depth uh, sensing or thermal emission profiling. Sure. So that's really cool. And uh, the question was related to uh, the assumption of thermal distribution. Of course, if you assume linear or maybe some other curve uh, as a thermal distribution, probably that should also change the spectrum. So my question is how unique is the solution, is the temperature profile that you get from this? So, um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, what we found is that if you, um, if you can measure your thermal emission spectrum with like infinite precision and accuracy, like it's perfect. Actually, I, I don't, I, I doubt that it's unique, unique, but it's quite unique. So uh, the, uh, we haven't proven, you know, we haven't done the analysis to prove this, but when we essentially like make fictitious data, not from a measurement, but we just do a forward calculation, we can recover even like rather complex profiles without assuming any sort of particular shape. Um, okay. so, so it is actually quite unique. In practice though, you're totally right. It's like not because there's noise on top of it and uh, it, it, it gets really tricky. So um, I, I can't answer this completely conclusively, but I can tell you what limitations we've run into. So um, if we assume uh, like a linear profile in this case, because we knew it was linear in the first place, we can do the extraction perfectly experimentally, yeah. no problem. If we don't assume anything, like if we don't assume yeah. linearity or any other shape, uh, as you can see from these circular, cir from these circular symbols, these circles over here, we can actually extract the temperature even without assuming any shape. So in the, okay. these circles, we didn't assume anything, but we limited ourselves to a four layer structure. Okay. Yeah. And what we found in our particular measurements with our particular extraction technique is if you have more than four layers in this particular experiment, we, it starts being a mess. Like we, we, were, we start to have more and more trouble to extract the profile. Um, and that's primarily, I think, limited by um, our signal to noise, our calibration, and also our extraction algorithm, which is quite suboptimal, I would imagine. Um, none of us in the group have experience in kind of very complicated fitting and optimization using, let's say, machine learning techniques or anything like that. And I suspect you can do a little bit better yeah. than what I showed. But even here, even in this initial result, 
even if you don't assume any sort of distribution at all, you can still fit pretty well. Um, and so this, and this is experimental data. So this gives us hope that you can do quite a bit better once you're a little bit more sophisticated about how you do these things. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, uh, we don't have any more questions. So with that, should uh, uh, let's thank our speaker, Mikhail Hex, uh, for, for giving such a wonderful webinar today. Also, I can uh, take this opportunity to virtually present him a small uh, gift uh, from our side. Yeah, <laughs> thank it, you. It, it, it was shipped to me and I'm very thankful. Thank you very much for uh, making time and giving this wonderful webinar and thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Guru. I really, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and thanks to, to you all for joining this webinar. I know that by now you're all uh, zoomed out on, on meetings and online conferences and seminars. So thanks again for taking the time.